Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Thursday, October 18th, Market Watchers Live show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swenlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, we got some selling taking a hold here again in the market. We got the Dow Jones Industrial Average currently down 332 points, the S&P 500 down 37, the NASDAQ down 143 points, and the Russell 2000 down 23. So it is across the board today. 10-year Treasury yield, you can see earlier today, was up over 3.2%, has fallen back and is roughly even with yesterday's close at about 3.17%. Volatility index, which had come back down into that 17 area, is now back on the move to the upside, up almost three points today, back to 20 and a quarter. Utilities leading on a relative basis, along with real estate, a couple of defensive areas of the market. Also, one of the best performers based on earnings, another uh, defensive performer, Philip Morris in the tobacco group, uh, having a really nice day, looking good. We'll talk about that in a bit. But on the downside, same old, same old. We got communication services, the XLC, getting hit hard to the downside, along with technology and consumer discretionary. And I could throw in here industrials and financials as well. The uh, aggressive areas of the market clearly underperforming. This is what we ran into last week. Seems to be picking back up again with that volatility increasing. We do want to be careful. Okay, Aaron, it is Thursday, October 18th, and I uh, can't believe fall is here. I'm in, I'm in Charlotte or a little bit south of Charlotte. I was outside this morning and temperatures were 55, which is pretty darn chilly here. I think we're going straight from summer to winter. Oh, wow. Yeah, not not so much here. It's pretty much been the same. <laughs> we're not in the hundreds. We're in the seventies. So, yeah, you know, I know, perfect weather. What can I say? That's... Yeah, talking about weather in Southern California is not going to be very exciting, unless you like that kind of weather, and that's really exciting. Well, that's true. I I do miss the seasons a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you don't really get that too much out there for sure. Yeah, I can always visit you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, and we've got a special guest today, Julius de Kempenar, joining us from the Netherlands. What kind of weather are you seeing over there, Julius? Uh, hi, Tom. Hi, Aaron. Um, we actually had a very good stint, a very nice Indian summer. So uh, I can still bike to my office wearing just a vest. I don't need a coat yet. Not sure how long that will last, but for now, we're doing pretty good. All right. Awesome. Well, it is awesome to have you here with us today. And I know you've got a Great presentation lined up for everyone. For those of you who are not familiar with Julius, he is the creator, founder of the RRG Charts. So he will be showing you how uh, you can take a look at different markets and so forth using the RRG Charts. They are extremely visual. And if you haven't seen them before, I think you'll be pre impressed in a bit. But Julius, if you can stick around with us, we'll be back to you probably in about 15 minutes or so. I'll be here. Sounds good. All right, Aaron, what do we got going today? All right. Well, let's first look at uh, the upcoming schedule Friday, tomorrow. I can't believe it's already Friday. Mary Ellen will be here for what's hot, what's not. Everything Stock Charts is back with us on Tuesday. So you'll want to stay tuned for that. Roman Bogomazov will be with us on Wednesday as a guest. So it should be a really great week coming up. Today's agenda uh, wow, Julius, that's a great title. I know everybody's going to be excited to see that. And we will do for 10 and 10, Electronic Arts, EA will be our first symbol. And then we're going to finish off with Sound Off. Julius has graciously accepted the challenge of doing that particular segment with Tom and I. So looking forward to that. But we do have some technical headlines and news, and I think there were an, an economic reporter. So, yeah, there they are. Yep, we got a few economic reports out this morning, uh, 8.30, of course, in during pre-market. Our normal Thursday initial jobless claims came out better than expected, 210,000 versus 215,000. Seem to be getting more and more down around that 200,000 level. I'm waiting to see if we go below that uh, maybe in the next few weeks. Who knows? October Philadelphia Fed survey came in 22.2, hotter than the 20.0 that was expected. And then finally, at 10 a.m. this morning, we had September leading indicators out. They rose five-tenths of 1%. That was exactly what the market was expecting. And as we take a look at the bond market, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we did gap up earlier on, the, on some of this economic news, but we've pulled back. And so I'm just looking at this really as just being in a trading range. Just looking back over the last six months, you can see we had Double top that was in at 3.11%, which also 
happened to be the highest level we'd seen in the last seven years. Uh, but we did break through that. And I believe that was the day the ADP employment report came out. Um, and that was two days before the uh, jobs report. Once the jobs report came out, though, we did see it peak at 3.25%. And since then, we've pulled back, got back to about 3.12%, maybe not all the way back down to that 311 where we broke out, but pretty close. And we continue to trade above the 20-day EMA. The good news, um, well, it's hard to say at this point. I think eventually it'll be good news if we do continue to see rates rising and it's for the right reasons, which would be a stronger economic environment ahead then I think we're probably going to see money rotating away from the treasuries, which is the way what happens when the treasury yield goes up. Money is rotating out of treasuries. Uh, the selling of treasuries cause the, causes the corresponding yields to rise. But that money coming out of treasuries most of the time in an expanding environment, uh, economic environment, you would expect that money to be rotating into U.S. equities. That has been the history. So far in October, that has not been the case. But I would be careful drawing conclusions too early. I think the market had made a pretty good move, probably needed a little bit of a pullback. We've seen that. Question is, how far do we go? And I think Julius's topic in just a few minutes is right on cue and uh, can't wait to hear that. But uh, first, uh, let's take a look at some of the earnings news because we had a number of companies reporting last night, some more this morning, and it is just going to continue to pick up over the next two, three weeks. Uh, but last night after the bell, we had Crown Castle come out. They uh, reported earnings of a buck thirty-nine, a little bit better than expected. SAP, Philip Morris, Danaher, and the Travelers Companies all reported earnings better than expected. We did have a slight uh, shortfall there in earnings from Nucor, a steel company. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the charts and see what these charts are telling us. First, let's go back to that Crown Castle chart. Um, I do want to just kind of go over a couple of things on the charts that I think look kind of interesting to me anyway. Uh, one thing that you'll notice when you look at Crown Castle, this is the mobile telecommunications space, by the way, the DJUSWC. And you can see a nice move up. And this group was in a flag, continues to be in a flag, which is pretty bullish. But just a few days ago, you can see that CCI had actually broken to multi multiple month lows and uh, came back up with today's earnings report, hit the 20-day moving average, but has since pulled back and is barely up on the session. The one thing that I noted was when you look at Crown Castle relative to the other mobile telecommunications companies or the, the, the group as a whole, you can see that Crown Castle has actually been one of the weaker performers. And on a relative basis, the company had been uh, down near its uh, one-year relative low. And so even though they came out with better than expected earnings, they also beat on the top line, by the way, 1.38 billion versus 1.35 billion. So even though they beat top and bottom line, we still are getting somewhat of a muted response and we couldn't get back through both price resistance and that 20 day moving average. So I think there's some weakness here in the chart on CCI. And personally for me, I would continue to avoid the stock despite what appeared to be a pretty good uh, earnings report. SAP, this is a big company in the software space. Uh, unfortunately, you can see we had been moving lower. And even as the group software had continued to push higher, you can see heading into this earnings report, uh, SAP was just kind of, you know, being lifted a little bit by the, by the group. But when you look at it on a relative basis, heading into earnings, it was near a one-year relative low versus all the software companies in that uh, peer group. So things were not looking that great for SAP, I don't believe, technically heading into the report. They managed to report inline revenues. They did beat bottom line, and they even raised their fiscal year outlook, uh, fiscal year 18 outlook, based on strong momentum in their cloud business. But still, when you look at the chart, you're getting a breakdown below some very key areas of support, key levels. 112 certainly looks like a big level. We had tested it multiple times, looks like maybe four times, holding it each time. And then with earnings, we gap down below it, despite what appeared to be a pretty decent earnings report. That's never a good thing when you got good news or what appears to be good news, the market still reacts negatively. Something to keep in mind. Next chart that I wanted to pull up, uh, Philip Morris. This one I think was probably the best report uh, of the lot today. We did hit uh, overhead gap resistance at the high and we pulled back from that. But I actually like the way this one is beginning to look. I do think that the tobacco stocks in general are weak, but you can see Philip Morris relative 
to the tobacco stocks had been strengthening heading into its earnings. It's been strengthening relative to the S&P 500. And the group, even though the group hasn't been strong, it has been uh, rotate, things have been rotating more toward the group. And you can see it at a five, six month relative high versus the S&P. Some of that is just simply money rotating here in October to more defensive areas. But, you know, we could go back really to the beginning of uh, September and see the outperformance in Philip Morris begin back then. I think this chart has uh, has turned the corner. We did hit that gap resistance pulling back, but I like the fact that it's holding its rising 20 day moving average. And so I would look for further strength down the road on Philip Morris. Uh, another one, Danaher, DHR. Uh, this company is in the medical equipment space. I'm on the fence here, and I if we finish week today, I'm going to be probably on the wrong side of the fence. I'll be on the bearish side of the fence. But if we finish strong, I'd be on the bullish side of the fence. There are some mixed signals with this chart. First of all, the medical equipment group has been very strong, but October has not been good. So you had one of the leading industry groups heading into October. Uh, since then, we've pulled back. You can see Danaher also has pulled back. But one of the down uh, – one of the things I think that's uh, more of a negative here is that Danaher, about six months ago, just began underperforming the entire group. So when you're looking at the chart, you see, you know, mostly movement to the upside. So maybe you don't think that poorly of the stock. But when you consider how quickly the medical equipment stocks were moving up, that was telling me that maybe uh, we should be careful in what we expect out of Danaher. The other thing I would point out, too, is that I think Danaher... Uh, was being lifted here recently. If we pull up the healthcare, small cap healthcare ETF and take a look at it relative to the larger cap uh, healthcare ETF, the XLV, and we go back a year, I think what you're going to see is that the small caps were outperforming the large caps until September. And in September, the small caps money started rotating away from them. And when we take a look at Danaher, that was about the time we began seeing outperformance in Danaher because Danaher is a much larger cap company. So money, it looks like starting to rotate back to Danaher, but I don't like this gap up and then failure. So I do want to be careful here with Danaher. Again, mixed signals. I'm not really sure which way this goes from here, but I do think that we have uh, some issues to at least deal with. Let's see how we finish today on Danaher. Travelers, not a good company here. Uh, well, good long-term company, I don't mean to say that, but just from a trading perspective, there really haven't been a lot of opportunities. You can see Travelers has been underperforming many of its uh, insurance peers. It's been underperforming the S&P, and its peers have been struggling against the S&P since topping back in March. So it's just a stock that really struggles. Um, the, uh, the flip side, the one really positive for Travelers is that from a seasonality perspective, over the last 20 years, look at October. It's gone up 85% of the time, and it does uh, average 5.6%. Uh, Travelers average is gaining 5.6% in October over the last 20 years. So it's got a lot of seasonal uh, tailwinds, but doesn't seem to be uh, making too much of a difference here in the near term. Uh, finally, I wanted to pull up SEE on a relative chart. This is sealed air. This is in the containers and packaging space. And this to me is like the poster child of what technical analysis is all about. You can see that the stock topped back at the end of uh, 2017, early 2018, and was working its way lower. You can also see that the containers and packaging index had been working lower. And this is a company that relative to this group, the group had been weak, but relative to the group, this stock had been declining for a few months. So this is the polar opposite of what you want to see in your stocks. You want stocks that are outperforming your peers or its peers, outperforming the S&P, moving up from left to right on the chart. This is exactly the opposite. Today, they warned. So anybody who doesn't follow technical analysis and follow the price action, I think you're missing the boat. This is telling us you can see the volume has been picking up on these uh, periods of decline. I think folks have been bailing. We've seen distribution. Now we're getting the fundamental news. With that, let's turn it over, Aaron. I know you've got some upgrades, downgrades. What's going on there? All right. Well, let's get started. We do have a number of upgrades and downgrades. All right. 
Oh my gosh, my screen's being weird again. It was so fine before the show. All right, so uh, upgrades. Good. I was just saying everything's good. Your, your screen's fine. Okay, so at the very top is, um, can you see the tabs on my um, browser? Yes. Okay, all right, I'll just ignore the green line that, that is lined up in the wrong place. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, Nike upgraded today. Uh, let me get you the stats on these. Uh, Oppenheimer upgraded Nike from a perform to an outperform. Let's take a peek at these charts. I can get that to come up here. Okay. Oh, well, that's great. It's trying to add it to a different one. All right. Okay, so I've already annotated a bunch of these. Uh, for Nike, you know, it's at some very important support. It managed to bounce off that 200-day EMA. You know, on the upgrade today, it's down one and a quarter percent. So I, I find that to be a little bit suspect. And the PMO is still in decline, uh, reaching readings we haven't seen pretty much since uh, the beginning of about a year ago from uh, October of last year. Uh, I, I'm going to show you the weekly chart just quickly, but I think this one is worth the watch list, at least for me. I would want to uh, watch that PMO turn up before I would get involved here. And when you look at that weekly chart, I think 70 is your support level. I don't think we're gonna end up going down to test it. But when I look at a PMO on the weekly chart on a sell signal that just came in, uh, it does make me cautious uh, about the possibility that we could see prices fall all the way down there. But you know, we got the upgrade today. Uh, I, I would hope that uh, we're gonna see, see some more upside movement. All right, uh, U.S. Bank Corp. also upgraded today by Oppenheimer, perform to an outperform. And you can see we got a nice bounce. Uh, actually, we had a really great rally yesterday and continuing uh, to be a, a trade above uh, where it did end up uh, getting and closing above that support level of 52.50, that short-term support level. We're now trading above it, but we are down uh, a you know, 0.64% uh, on U.S. Bank Corp. I'm kind of wondering if we're going to finally see these banks perk up. Uh, I think I noticed at least one other uh, bank that had been upgraded today. So it'll be interesting to see how we, we follow through on this. But I like the fact we are trading above here, even though we have pulled back uh, to this level we had of short-term support. And it does line up uh, fairly well here with that low we had back in December. So we got the push through. I'm going to start looking for $55 as the top, but I'm still a little uh, leery of the uh, bank space. Downgrades. IBM was downgraded today uh, from uh, Goldman Sachs from a neutral to a sell. Uh, and you can see we've broken down. This is a weekly chart because you can't uh, find support on the uh, daily chart right now. So I, I figured a good idea to look at the weekly. Notice we're just now getting a PMO sell signal on the weekly chart. That's an intermediate term sell signal. We've broken down below the support level we had back in 2017. So we have broken down below the 2017 low. Bad, bad, bad. Uh, I'm hoping, I would hope that we could find support here at that uh, 130 mark. Um, but, you know, with the downgrade, it's been so weak. Uh, I, I would stay away from this one as far as trying to bottom fish. Uh, Pulte Group, as well as Toll Brothers, was uh, downgraded today. And you can see we are sitting right there on some important support. Again, this was one of the charts I had to move to a weekly because we've already hit lows. Uh, uh, that are um, annual lows that we have not seen in this year. So I wanted to go back and see where the important support levels were. And we are sitting right on it for Pulte Group. So if it wants, if we're going to get the turnaround, this is the place to get it. If we're not, and with a downgrade, there's a good chance we won't. I think you could see a drop all the way down to $18 here. And look at that PMO. It's pretty much in free fall uh, on the weekly chart. That That's bad to bad news as well. Teradyne, uh, just go through these quick. Uh, Goldman Sachs moved it from a neutral to a sell. And you can see we are sitting on some very important support that will need to hold. I have a PMO 
uh, top below the signal line. Bad, bad, bad. Uh, on the downgrade. A wing stop also downgraded today by Morgan Stanley from overweight to equal weight. I do have a buy signal here and it's pulled back to this area of support at about $70. So even though this one was downgraded, uh, I, I would add this to the watch list. I will probably add it to mine. Uh, we might see that pull back down to the $65 level. Um, but the fact that I do have that buy signal um, does make me a little bit more optimistic here. Uh, other big downgrades that I didn't go over, analog, uh, ADL, GAP, uh, Halliburton, uh, Union Pacific. Uh, some of the upgrades, uh, Diamond Offshore, G3, Rig, Texas Instruments, uh, those were some of the uh, bigger name upgrades today. So, all right, with that, I'm going to pass it over, uh, introduce Julius once again. I know you have some great uh, information to share with us, so I'm gonna just let you get right started now. Hi, Aaron, yes, thank you very much. Um, let me grab the screen really quickly here so people can follow what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, the, the thing is, when I was preparing for this appearance, I, um, I, I read a little bit what other people have been saying, I followed the news and it's very clear that you know people are more worried or more attentive than they have been over the past few years because there's clearly something going on. Um, and everybody's talking about the big picture. You know, is, is this is this the um, the big peak? Is it something new, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, um, hence the little bit suggestive title of my talk: How many red flags do you need? Because what I tend to do when stuff like this happens is to step back and, and actually take, do take a look at the big picture. Uh, and clearly I try to use uh, the relative rotation graphs for that because I do think that they are um, showing you the big picture in one picture, which has been the slogan for, uh, for quite a while already. Um, so before diving in, what I like to share with you is a couple of uh, let's call it theoretical things, background information. Um, most of this stuff is coming from John Murphy's book uh, on intermarket analysis, trading intermarket analysis. It's it's one of my Bibles that's pretty much on my desk all the time, full with little stickers and notes, etc. Um, and the stuff that I want to try, I'm not going to, it's probably not going to work all the way, but what I'm going to try to check off is some of the asset class interaction and what John says and, and what you know, economic theory says is that bonds are usually changing direction before stocks do, and then stocks usually change direction before commodities do. And also that bond yields peak first at tops, stocks second, and commodities last. And these rotations are less reliable at bottoms than at tops. Well, with regard to that last item, I think that we can all agree that we are looking, if we're looking for something, we're looking for a top. We're not looking for a bottom because that was back in 2009. Um, if we bring U.S. asset classes uh, or U.S. equity markets into a bigger picture, then uh, we're going to talk about some foreign influence. And it's very clear that all global stocks are closely correlated. I mean, this day and age, you know, everybody knows everything like three milliseconds after it happens all around the world. Um, John's observation is that a rising US dollar benefits US stocks, but he's also admitting that it's one of the most difficult relationships that he has been studying over the past decades, probably. Um, and a weaker dollar favors foreign stocks. Now, the relationship is weak and it needs to tie in with the movements in commodities and inflationary pressure. And I can give you a little bit of a spoiler here that US dollar relationship with commodities is the most difficult one or the most uncertain one that I can find at the time. Um, and the other things that we can see is um, in terms of stock market relationships, uh, every now and then I turn to comparisons of small caps versus mid caps and large caps. And the observation that we're looking at here is that small caps are usually leading during bull markets and large caps are leading during, well, not bull markets. And the other one that we can look at is growth versus value. And the, the um, common denominator seems to be that growth stocks are leading during a bull market. 
Now, with that in mind, let's have a look at what's going on. Um, oh, by the way, if you talk about um, a little bit more background, I can I can highly recommend this article in uh, Chart School about sector rotation analysis uh, because it goes into the relationship with the business cycle and regular viewers and readers of my blog may have come across me using um, the sector rotation model of Sam Stovall every now and then to try to um, to position the various sectors on the economic cycle. Um, but this one is also very interesting, um, and it looks at asset classes during the various stages of the economic cycle. So above the line is expansion, below is contraction. Um, this one is divided in six stages, and it indicates where you can expect the varied asset classes to go up or down. And the... Um, Asset class rotation with the stock rotation model comes uh, a little bit lower. And what you may forget every now and then, and where I look at it, is the, the same picture is also on the birth charts all the way down. And that has some extra inf interesting information because here you see during the various stages, you see what other sort of macro indications can be. It's industrial, industrial production, interest rates, and especially also the yield curve gives you uh, a lot of information. Now, as I said, my title was a little bit suggestive in terms of you know how many red flags do you need. You could read that I was in the camp that a big market top is in place. If you go back to my most recent blog, um, I just basically took the long-term chart of uh, the S&P 500, or you can take the Dow, they're all like that. I print it off. I like to print off charts every now and then and take a, a big felt pen and start annotating that chart. And if you do it like this and just draw a big fat line using a ruler under your major lows, um, there is no other conclusion possible than that this uptrend and this support is still intact. Um, so that's the basic premise, because trends uh, tend to continue more often than they reverse. So for now, we have to assume that this trend is still intact. And the, least, the, the most recent dip, yes, it was very swift. Yes, it was maybe unexpected. Yes, it was very fast and it was a little bit scary. But for the time being, our support line has held up. It looks as if we have a low in place here. Not sure, we're going to investigate that a little bit more later on. But for the time being, we have to assume that this uptrend is still intact. Okay. Um, if we go to the RRG that shows us the various asset classes, then this is the one that we're looking at. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Um, it's very clear that there is only one asset class still in the inside the leading quadrant, and that's equities, that's SPY. Yes, it's heading down, it's rolling over, but it's still inside the leading quadrant, which means that, you know, from this model point of view, the relative uptrend is still intact. And by the way, we're using VBINX, which is a, um, uh, a balanced benchmark that holds 60% in equities and 40% in bonds. And the equity market, um, on a weekly basis is still outperforming uh, that benchmark. Now, a couple of other things that, um, that catch my interest. Um, for the first, the, the first thing is that this is a, a, a trio of fixed income ETFs. It's IEF, which is government bonds, LQD, which is corporate bonds, and HYG, which is um, high yield bonds. They are all either inside or moving towards the improving quadrant and moving higher, SPY is moving lower. They're still on the wrong side of the equation. SPY is still on the right side of the equation. Commodities are a bit of an outlier here. It's a big fat tail moving higher. Um, yes, that is positive. It means that commodities have had some momentum very recently. But what worries me a little bit is that it is gaining a lot on the momentum axis, but not very much on the relative strength axis. So uh, it's still very far away from crossing over to the positive, to the leading side of the quadrant. 
So I'm keeping an eye on this, but I'm not very impressed so far. Um, if we move to the daily version of this chart, we're going to turn things upside down because what you will see there is that SPY has now just crossed over into the lagging quadrant and this, this cluster of fixed income um, ETFs has moved over. So the equation uh, bonds ETFs is now on a daily basis favoring the fixed income part, which is a little bit more defensive. Um, so this could be your first warning signal, or as I wrote about it in my recent blog, um, because what you can see, if we go back to the weekly, um, it is very well possible that rotations take place on the left or on the right-hand side of the graph. Um, let's animate this a little bit, because you can see what happened very recently that during the last run up you see here that this is about a year's worth of data spy is on the right hand side the cluster of fixed income is on the left hand side we move up spy moves down goes into weakening this is a little bit what we are right now you know what we're seeing right now spy is in weakening uh, uh, sorry spy let me go spy is in leading moving down the fixed income stuff is is moving higher there and if we continue SPY move down into weakening, just like the fixed income stuff started improving inside the improving quadrant heading towards leading, and then it turns around before it can actually cross over into lagging and goes back into SPY being on the right-hand side and the fixed income stuff being on the left-hand side. Now, this is the sign of a very strong trend. So very strong trends um, in relative, relative strength terms do not move in a straight line. They move up and down uh, a little bit and, and they can rotate on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. So there's still a, a possibility that SPY will rotate on the right-hand side and fixed income stuff will rotate on the left-hand side. Now, if we go to uh, the daily for a more zoomed-in picture, um, that is still possible. But what would need to happen here is that this daily rotation needs to turn around really quickly to be able to, to pull uh, SPY back up to leading and these fixed income ETFs back to lagging, because that's what you want to see. For this market to continue higher, for this equity market to continue higher, we need SPY to rotate through lagging, improving, back to leading really, really quickly before SPY turns into the weakening lagging quadrant on the weekly chart. Uh, on the opposite side, uh, the same thing has to happen um, for the fixed income stuff. So this is what I'll be monitoring very, very closely. If we go to um, individual um, stocks, or uh, as a matter of fact, individual charts, because the, uh, the other one that we said is that bonds uh, need to peak before bonds, uh, uh, bonds need to peak before stocks, and I want to take a look at um, IEF because I think that's a very interesting chart. I wrote about it in one of my blogs not too long ago um, when it was pushing against that trend line, that downtrend line. And this is what you see here. And let me snap that to the right. And I will bring the asset class to the left so we can get that in sync. Here is our weekly. Bring that up there. So here is IEF on the left-hand side, uh, moving higher. And here is the chart of IEF. And what I am looking at in terms of price, and this is, this is very important, it's not about in terms of price, this looks like a gigantic descending triangle to me. Um, whatever you want to call it, uh, maybe there are people who want to call this a head and shoulders top and draw a neck line here that's already been broken. That's fine. I think it's a little bit long for, for head and shoulders. Could be, it's a very large one. But whatever you want to call this pattern, it looks like a topish pattern. I mean, we've got these major, major highs coming in at lower levels, and we just put in another lower high just around 102, 103 before we started moving lower. And we're now actually pressing against that 100 level. And if we zoom in on this chart, let's make this a little bit shorter and get a bigger picture. 
We're looking at that 100 level. If that breaks, that I think that'll be a major signal. It'll, it'll push yields higher and it'll, be, it'll push bond uh, prices lower. But more importantly, in terms of this RRG and the relative stuff, it looks like as if it's turning around this relative trend. And look at the RRG lines here, that red RS ratio line dropped below 100 uh, back in 2016, and it has never returned higher all the time. It's been underperforming that balanced benchmark. And now for the first time, it looks to be breaking that downtrend line. And if we change this into a daily chart and look at the RRG lines, you will see that this is actually uh, a nice bottom in place at picking that up. So despite the fact that it is very well possible and maybe even likely that IEF is going to break below 100 and move lower in price, it looks as if it's one of the stronger asset classes. And that is not good for equities. That is, that is a big red flag, if you ask me. Um, in terms of SPY, and then we look at the bigger picture first uh, on the weekly chart, there we have that. Let me bring my own SPY chart back. That's annotated. This is the big picture that I've been looking at. This trend is still intact. We had this nice triangle, triangle breakout. If you expand, extend this, this support line, then you can see that big red trend line that I had drawn on the, um, on the initial chart that I showed. And we're, we're resting at that support level. But here also, there is for the first time in a very long period, it looks like as if we are breaking below a support line on relative strength. The RS ratio here is the complete opposite of what we saw for the government bonds. It's still way above 100 and it moved there uh, back in 2016. If we swap this to a weekly, to a daily chart, we can get more granular picture. This is rolling over and breaking down. Our G lines are positioning SPY inside the lagging quadrant. This low here, as we saw on the long one, this is touching that long trend line. And we're, out, we're already rolling over again and, and coming lower. So the level for S&P uh, or SPY in this case that I'm looking is that 270 low. Um, if that 270 low gives way, uh, on the daily, uh, I'll get nervous. If that 270 low gives way at a weekly close, I get really nervous. So uh, that's a level that, I'm, uh, that I'll be monitoring very, very closely uh, in coming ways. And tomorrow will be a big day for that, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, so that's the, um, that's the second uh, big red flag. I'll speed it up here um, because, well, I got a little more time. Um, so if we then move to the um, various sizes uh, of the market, I, I call these size indices, um, this, is a, this is an RRG that shows you the rotation of um, small caps, mid caps, and large caps versus the uh, Dow Jones US index, which pretty much completes all US equities. And what you see here is that large caps are inside the leading quadrant and small caps are well underway inside the lagging quadrant um, and pushing very rapidly further uh, uh, and lower on the RS ratio scale. Now, this is actually an interesting chart to, uh, to animate because you can see the interaction between the various sizes over time. So here we have large caps inside leading Market's going down, um, so we're in we're in a decline here. Uh, at late 2015, this is, uh, and you see that large caps are rolling over. And very early here, this is you know just after it comes out of that trough, you see that small caps are picking up, and they're moving higher and leading the market because large caps are now starting to lag, while small caps are starting to move, and this is very very early stage of that move uh, that's on the way. Start to move higher, then they roll over a little bit, go further to the right, so small caps still continue to move higher on the right-hand side while large caps are moving higher. So this is a counter momentum move. Move higher, and now we're coming into sort of a you know, decline, temporary decline, and you see small, small caps losing strength Large caps picking up, 
that continues. And then they move over and jump back. So this is a rotation. What we just saw on the asset class with SPY and government bonds, we now see that happening with small caps and large caps. Uh, and I know that it is a little bit less clustered and I could zoom it in to make it clearer, but if I continue to animate, it will scroll off my screen. So I'll leave it like this for you because you know that um, large caps are in this cluster here and moving lower. And you will see that trend continuing and you will see that small caps are leading while the market is continuing higher. Loses again. And here we have a little temp move going down. This is a little bit of a bigger move for the first time in two years. This is some sort of a slowdown in the market. Doesn't really know what they do. And if, if there is a slowdown, you'll see that people flock to large cap because they're apparently the more safer bets than small caps. But that doesn't last long. And when stuff starts to turn for the better again, you see that small caps are starting to move higher inside improving and picking up and they go all the way up and you see there is a dip coming on and you see that small caps start losing again. This was a very short term stint. Large caps are leading through this decline. And then when this starts, you see that small caps are picking up and since April, March, during the rally, you see small caps leading. And now they just recently started to roll over and move into lagging well before the market peaked here. And now we are uh, in, in large cap country. Um, another big red flag. Uh, large caps are leading, small caps are lagging. That's usually not good for the equity markets. Another relationship that we can look at uh, is value versus growth. Um, and what we see here, usually bull markets are driven by growth stocks and bear markets or trading markets are pretty much mixed or value orientated. Here we see that growth is still in favor. That's in favor for a very long time and uh, the, the distance between the two, the two uh, groups has been massive. And here also you can see these rotations on the left hand side, growth has been rotating all the way there it started moving back in the day, growth on the right-hand side, and you see every rotation was in favor of growth staying there. And now we're moving up a little bit and we started moving left. If we do this on a daily chart, we're gonna flip it upside down and you see that value has already taken over a little bit during that decline. There is now a bit of a hiccup. So this is another one a uh, potential red flag in the making where value is taking over. If value here starts to con continue to rotate on the right and be stronger than growth, that's, that relationship will shift over um, in favor of value on the large, uh, longer term picture as well, which is another red flag for uh, the equity market as a whole. Now, if these are all red flags and um, markets start to break below that 2700 uh, or 270 in SPY level for the equity market, um, we may want to look at other markets that are potentially interesting for us. And that's where we shift to an international picture. And I quickly put together a, uh, an RRG for um, uh, some international equity markets. And I got to warn you here, because these are end of day data, and what you will see here that a lot of these markets are closed. And when you see a table like this, it means that the most recent data for like Tokyo and Shanghai and emerging markets are not in yet. And they'll give you weird um, turns on the tails because uh, the S&P obviously is still there uh, and it's already in. So what you want to do is basically shift one period back when everything is filled and you will see the, the, the proper direction of these tails. And the one thing that strikes me right now is that the S&P is still one of the stronger markets, but it's losing momentum. India, very weak, losing a lot of momentum. Um, this is the um, uh, FTSE, uh, very, very bad, Lose, losing strength. Uh, sorry, this is uh, Canada. Uh, this is Europe. This is all on the left-hand side, picking up momentum, but 
pretty much nothing on relative strength. The only one that a strong RNG had in inside leading is the Japanese Nikkei index. Um, I'm running out of time right now, um, but look at what well, we can look at this chart. I'm just going to look at this one here. This is the Nikkei index. Let me put that side by side with that. This one here. And you will see the strength of the Nikkei. And if you look at that relative strength, that pretty much has done nothing for about a year now. And it's, 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 it's waking up. It's breaking above its highs. Those RRG lines are turning around. We're already in the second leg of that move. Look at this. If we scroll that back, you can see that the Nikkei was already improving. And it came, oops, it came down. Here it is. Came down and managed to turn around very swiftly and very rapidly, which is a strong sign, and turn into that leading quadrant as one of the, well, basically the only one at a strong heading. And if you look at that chart here, that uptrend is still intact. We're moving lower. Maybe we even break lower, but I think that the downside for the Nikkei index is much better protected than the downside for, say, US stocks or European stocks or Indian stocks. Um, uh, lo and behold, that we break higher, then it's even very, very strong. But here, this relative looks really good. So Japanese stocks right now, very good alternative for U.S. stocks. For the U.S. stock market, um, a lot of red flags, but the most important uh, aspect um, that we can have, the big picture, that big support line is still intact. So as long as that happens, I'm not going to pull the trigger to get out of U.S. stocks altogether. Maybe I want to diversify a little bit out of, um, you know, U.S. stocks to Japanese stocks. Um, as if and when 2,700 on the S&P is broken decisively at a weekly close, um, I think we have a very major price peak in place and um, we'll probably uh, be in for uh, the first more serious correction since 2009. Um, we're not there yet, but there's a lot of red flags warning us right now. Um, so keep an eye on that. Um, I hope I can warn you in time in my blogs. I'll surely be uh, monitoring all of these situations and trying to keep uh, on top of it. Tom, you, th yeah, how am I doing? About three minutes left for questions. Yeah, we got a, we got a couple minutes. Uh, I didn't know, Aaron, do you have any questions from the room? Uh, you know, honestly, let's see, there was one that I'm going to answer when we do 10 and 10 about how you get uh, an RRG on a chart list. Although if you want to show that real quick, uh, Julius, you can do that. Um, I'm not sure what the question is. How you can? Oh, uh, yeah. So how, you know how we, if you have a chart list, how can you view it as an RRG? Ah, okay. Yeah, we can do that. That's very easy, actually. Um, and, uh, he, also, they are wondering if your methodology uh, applies to ETFs and indexes, not just the stocks. It applies to everything that moves, I would say. <laughs> um, but with one caveat, um, it's garbage in, garbage out. So please make sure that whatever ticker, the, the system will draw an RRG. There's no doubt about it. Um, but be careful what you throw at it, especially when you do stuff like this that we've just been doing with these um, asset classes. Um, that's very tricky because here we're comparing equities with bonds. And you all know that bonds are moving in reverse with um, uh, yields. So let's just for fun throw in... Um, Aaron, you know, what is, what is the symbol for yield? It's, it's dollar. Oh, um, T, uh, TX. So the, sorry? TNX. T, dollar TNX, right? Yes. Okay. So that's 10-year yields. Yep. All right. There you go. So here is yields, and here is IEF, which is 7 to 10-year yields, which is kind of weird because I would expect them to actually move straight opposite so i'll investigate that a little bit better maybe come back later in the show but um please make sure that you actually uh put in a symbol for bonds that's going up when yields are going down and the the, the symbol is going down when when yields are going up um so um that's that's very important because this, this tnx is going down now, right now right 
but TNX is going up actually. Mm -hmm. What is this right thing? Yeah, so yeah, and IEF is going down. Yeah, it's a little bit of a momentum move, but um, so this this should theoretically, in, in general, move opposite of IEF, right? Yep. Am I correct? Okay. Oh. Um, so that is why it looks as if TNX is super super strong, uh, but it's really not. It's actually pretty weak. And if you look at IEF, um, well, if this cracks, we're, we're going lower. So um, so that is what you're looking at. So. Um, yeah, Too long either. answer for a short question. Yeah. Make sure that apples and apples and oranges and oranges go on the chart. Right. And then somebody yeah. did mention that, you know, you, you've talked a few times about bonds um, rolling over, you know, peaking. Mm -hmm. um, and the question was, well, have they? Question mark. <laughs> well, here's the chart. Yeah. I, Here, I, here's IF. They rolled over back in 2016. So, uh, yeah, they rolled <laughs> over. It was 108 there. It's 100 now. Yeah. So we are peaking. even even for the last few weeks. They peaked at 102. They're 100 now. It's a, it's a big move in bonds. Right. It's serious. I mean, this is not. It's not a stock. What you what you're looking at. This is bonds. I mean, this is a massive move. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah, they have rolled over. Um, and if they break 100, they roll over even even more. Um, uh, and the question: How do you bring your chart list into RRGs? If you if you go to the chart list. You say view as there is RG there, and boom, you can throw it at it. And you can, uh, I always use for this one, I use VBI and X, so you can change that benchmark, and there you are. So now you have your RG for your chart list. If your chart list changes, this RG will change accordingly. All right. Well, that pretty much covers the, the questions in the room. I suspect if uh, you have any more, Julius does tend to go in there. Um, he'll be the, in there during the 10 and 10. So if you have any more questions. Yeah, yeah. I'll do that. Julius. Yes, Tom. You know I'm not going to let you get away without a question, so I've got, I got one for you. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's make the assumption that we do break down. You, you've, you've you know provided a lot of different levels, a lot of different things to watch, and many red flags and so forth. Let's make the assumption that the breakdown occurs and you turn more bearish. On you, stocks. On stocks, on U.S. Yes. stocks. Right. What, what do you do? Do you short? Do you simply wait to cash for a while? Do you? I am, I am not much of a trader, so I will move out of stocks and, and hide somewhere, either in cash or something that is um, – you know, uh, more stable. Uh, but when I look at the bond market, I'm not very happy about that. You know, you could, you can, you can do a lot of, um, you know, uh, asset allocation plays by switching between SPY and IEF, for example. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, closely monitoring the commodities market because they have been in the doldrums for so long. Uh, they've come down massively. And I thought a few times that they were putting in a low and moving higher, but Every time that failed, and it looks to be a massive trading range right now. Um, but that could be a good alternative for stocks uh, for the time being. So, um, you know, if you look at this, you know, I started looking at commodity back in 2016, and I thought this downtrend is over, and we go higher, and then it didn't happen. And I think I did it again in 2017, and it didn't happen. Um, so now, uh, you know, you got this massive overhead resistance here. That's probably 26 US dollars on DJP. Um, if that relative strength improves against that VBI and X benchmark, uh, then yes, that could be a, uh, a good place to switch to instead of stocks if, if things start to move like that. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, if you can stick around, I know you, you uh, did I will. say that you would, you would stick around for us and we'll do a uh, really fun sound off segment here in just a bit. But uh, let us get ahead in uh, head into the 10 in 10 and I guess while we're doing this, if you have an opportunity, maybe you can uh, chat with the folks in the room if there are any other questions. I will do that. I'll get on it right away. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, Julius. Great presentation, by the way. <laughs> okay, Aaron, what do we got? All righty. Let's see. Today's 10 and 10. I had about uh, 30 requests. Uh, looking at them on the RRG real quickly. There you go. A few outliers we might be looking at. Uh, but the main thing I do like to check out are the sectors that have been requested. 
And as you can see, it looks like healthcare and technology, technology always seems to be uh, on the high side of requests, but healthcare, quite a few in healthcare today. So we'll probably look at a few of those. I'll get it started though, electronic arts. Okay, well, I will first say before I even take a look at any of these charts that uh, I, I think it is definitely a time to be cautious. Anytime the volatility index moves up above that 16, 17 area, and we start seeing these swift drops to the downside. I think you have to be really careful. Um, you know, just when you think you catch a bottom, next thing you know, it rolls over again. So most of the stocks I look at right now, just keep in mind, I'm looking at it kind of uh, um, not with rose colored glasses. I'm not sure what color your glasses are if they're the opposite of rose. Um, but <laughs> those, those are the glasses I have on right now. I think you wanna be real careful. So I look at uh, Electronic Arts EA and I see a stock that in the short term anyway is stair-stepping lower. Um, it's TA 101. You're gapping down big volume. You consolidate bear flag. You break down again on big volume. We move back up. We can't get through gap resistance. And then we break down again. Volume increases. Now we've got that overhead resistance and the 20 day moving average just above 110. I would respect that resistance level until EA begins to strengthen and starts to show more bullish characteristics. All right. And interestingly, the most popular in the chat room happens to be a Canadian stock. It is Yamana Gold, YRI.TO. All right, YRI.TO. I like the behavior so far. What I have said about gold in the past, and I think this applies here, I think in the short term, we're starting to see strength. Long term, this has been seven years of underperformance in gold. So if they start to fail on the short term chart, then I would be very careful um, in terms of making sure I keep my stops in play. Big volume breakout above this consolidation. Uh, now you've got the 20-day rising. So far, you can kind of see that each time we've been anywhere near the 20-day, we've been turning higher. So I think in the short term, with the PPO turning positive, things look better here, but I would have a tight stop. I don't trust gold. I still personally think the dollar goes higher, and if the dollar goes higher, I think that's going to be serious headwinds for gold. So I want to make sure I keep my stop in play. For me, I've closed back below the 20 day and I would be moving back to the sidelines. All right. Uh, the next one also very popular in the room is uh, ESIO, Electric Scientific. All right. I know this was on my strong earnings chart list a while back. Um, I, maybe it still is. There's the gap up in August. I kind of remember that being strong earnings. So I'm thinking it's on the list, but it probably hasn't come up on my um, scans for a while because most of my scans run uh, RSI 40 to 50. And you can see that all of this selling really uh, became problematic for ESIO. And uh, it, it really wasn't following bull market rules. The one positive is that the support line that was established back in early July, that low. We did print a hammer and we're trying to bounce off of it. But like so many stocks, I've been talking about this a lot over the past week, look at the failure at that 20 day moving average. So I think this one is squeezing into a pretty tight uh, range between about 1540 and 1670. Let's see which way breaks first. All right, uh, let's see next one. How about Home Depot? What are you thinking about uh, that with the hurricanes, et cetera? Well, it broke down yesterday or a couple of days ago, and it's gotten um, uh, some downgrades of late, and the volume has picked up. You can see the PPO is very weak. I don't like trying to be a hero and trying to catch these stocks, uh, the falling knife theory. Um, now, Home Depot is a great company. It will eventually uh, find its support, but I'm not going to try to convince the market where that support is. At this point, I would have expected 190 to hold. You can see yesterday it went below, and I believe that was the downgrade. Heavy volume on the selling, that is continuing. So at this point, yes, it's oversold. We could see a bounce at any point, but I'm not sticking my hand out there to catch that falling knife, and I'm not jumping in front of the freight train, so I'm going to sit on the sidelines. All righty. Uh, next one I have is one we've never looked at. Uh, it is an ETF, Banex Vector Unconventional Oil and Gas which is F-R-A-K. All right, that was a mouthful. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to stretch this out a year because the six months really isn't showing me a whole lot. 
Um, yeah, I mean, off of, it looks like it's got an uptrend in play, a little bit of a scare back in early September, bounce back. Um, and this looks very similar to a lot of energy stocks where it just looks like we have an uptrend, then it looks like we have a downtrend, then it looks like we have an uptrend again. I, you know, my overall longer term bias, I think here is to the upside. I'm just not sure that uh, in the near term, I see an opportunity here. Maybe a little bit more weakness down around 1570 to 1550. You can see where that low candle body and then the low tail is. That is an area that I would look to see, you know, hope that it would hold with perhaps a move back up to resistance. So as it moves down closer, I could make an argument based on support recent price levels, but I'm not a big fan right now because, uh, like I said, there's just been too many times where the group overall has disappointed. All right. Uh, next one up, uh, Abbott Labs, ABT. Yeah, Abbott uh, had been a pretty good performer. I know they just came out with their earnings. I think they're still holding up pretty well relative to a lot of other stocks. So, you know, if I was going to go into something, and I, and I do think that this – gives you some protection being in the um, healthcare space because healthcare has been one of the strongest areas. It is a little bit more defensive. And I would say as long as we hold on to right about the 66, 67 area, uh, that would be a level I'd watch pretty closely, especially the volume has been heavy lately. So if we do break that support, the volume's heavy and we lose that PPO center line, then I'd grow more cautious. All righty. Let's see next one up uh, GNC in the consumer staples area of course all right uh, starting to strengthen and then when I talk about bullish characteristics I'll show you exactly what I mean here I mean I talked about it a little bit with um, with gold and you can see here we had a reaction high up to about 440 we pulled all the way back down set a pretty important level of support there came back up to 440 failed but look at the bullish characteristics normally when you're trending down and you move through the 20 day you just quickly move right down back down below it and just keep trending lower you keep having failures on moves to the upside but when i start to see a stock break above the 20 and then test the 20 and then break out again that is much more bullish to me so let's see we got do have a couple of tails here so it's a little worrisome but if we do make this break out above 450, get a little volume coming in, then I think we have a shot maybe to make a run at the next key resistance, which would be up at 550. Okay. Uh, let's see. Gilead Sciences. All right. Biotech. We looked at a pharmaceutical. Let's look at a biotech. Yeah, and I think probably on a relative chart. Uh, I know this one was underperforming for a while. Uh, yeah, it's kind of just meandering. I mean, if you're looking for one of the strongest stocks in the biotech space, this probably isn't it. Maybe you might want to just kind of follow this relative trend line, make sure that doesn't break, or the trend line in the biotechs in general, make sure that doesn't break. Here you can see, though, what I was talking about. Gilead relative to the biotechs was strong, then it was weak, strong, weak, but it's just kind of going back and forth. We don't have that steady outperformance. So I don't think you're getting one of the best stocks in biotechs. That's one of the problems. Now, as far as you know, what you might look for, well, I think key support is clearly, at least over the past few months, clearly been just below the 72 level. We have now had multiple tests there. If it fails to hold, you start seeing the stock trading down 71.50, $71, especially if the volume's picking up, I would be out of it. Um, so this is where I would hang my hat right here on this price support level. Okay. Our only industrial that was requested, Republic Services, RSG. All right. Well, you're getting a little bit more of defensive stock here, which I like in this kind of a market. I do think it held on to its support pretty well. Here's the group, which had broken out in September, has pulled back recently, but I still think the overall trend here is higher. I think the overall relative strength in RSG relative to its peers remains higher. Relative to the S&P, it's trying to break out, and the group relative to the S&P is trying to break out. So this isn't a, the kind of uh, stock or group that I would be interested in in a really uh, surging bull market. I think these would take a back seat. But in this kind of an environment, I do think this is provides maybe a little bit of safety. And there is your breakout on increasing volume at the end of July. We've gone down. We've tested it. Now look at what we're, you know, keep bringing this up. But over the past three or four weeks, 
trying to get through that 20 day moving average. It has not been easy. So I think we're in a two dollar range right now. Let's see if we break below 70 or break out above 72. And I'd like to see volume confirm that move. All right. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Last one that we have is Centerpoint Energy, uh, one of the few utilities requested. Which uh, ticker on that one? Oh, CNP. My bad. Sorry. That's all right. I know many of them, but I couldn't remember. <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah, 26 and a half to 27 has been key support here. Um, so that is something that I would probably watch. Um, it hasn't been a great per relative performer, at least its group has not been a great relative performer. But those are the two areas of support as we've pulled back. So I'd be watching this area of support, I think to the upside, right at about those recent highs at 29. We did get just a bit above it back in uh, early December of 2017. But that's kind of the range, 26.50, 27 to the downside, 29 to the upside. We're sitting almost right in the middle of the range, so it's hard to really get behind it. But if you look at the stock relative to its peers, it's just kind of, you know, middling, you know, middle of the pack relative to the S&P. It's been struggling to break out and the group relative to the S&P is struggling to break out. So I don't see anything here to get excited about at this point. Like I said, maybe a move down to 26 and a half, 27 would set up a decent reward to risk trade. Until then, I'd probably pass. All righty. That concludes the 10 and 10. And here are the symbols that we just went over. I will have those up in the Market Watchers Live chart list. And you can find the link to the chart list at the top of the Market Watchers Live blog. And I do include them in every recap as well. All right, time for our final market update. Let's see what's been going on. All right, here we go. Currently, as you can see, we've got the Dow. Uh, pretty much all the large cap indexes are lower. Looks like we tried to have a bit of a, a rebound there uh, around lunchtime uh, while we, when we went on air, but uh, not, not really working out. It's starting to fall again. We have uh, most of the large cap indexes down over 1.15%. Uh, NASDAQ is suffering more. It is down almost one and three quarters percent. Uh, currently down almost 137 points for the NASDAQ. S&P 100 also having a difficult day. Uh, 400, Russell 2000, small and mid caps uh, suffering uh, just as the others. Russell 2000 down about one and a third percent. Treasury, uh, I'm sorry, the TSX Canadian markets are also down following suit with US markets. Treasury yields are currently unchanged right now, 3.179%. UP is on the rise after bouncing back uh, from yesterday's close. And gold is also up, but beginning to pull back. Likely a little bit of that is due to the rise in the dollar. Finally, bonds almost unchanged with TLT up three cents. And USO is down almost a full percentage point, reading right now at 1468 for USO. And that's all I have for the final market update. I'm going to pass it back to you, Tom. All right, I wanted to just take a quick look at the S&P 500 here on the daily chart. You can see the breakdown. I think that's pretty clear, uh, the heavier volume. The, the move back to the upside was on lighter volume, but that's typical. I, I can't remember too many times where we see volume heavier on the way back up than we see it on the way down. Most people, you know, fear is a very uh, emotional or very, very strong emotion. And uh, so we do see a lot of selling, panic selling when markets are going down and not nearly as much. I don't think greed is nearly as uh, uh, strong uh, an emotion as fear. But anyhow, as we've started to move lower again, by the way, check out, we had five days in a row or four days in a row where we had higher lows in place. We've already pierced that to the downside. So I'm beginning to think that this, uh, this little mini rally that we had, the bounce has ended and I'm expecting prices to roll back over. You can see that the PPO, which was starting to bounce just a little, has quickly turned down just with this little bit of selling today or maybe I shouldn't say a little bit, down 34 points. But relative to some of the other days, uh, we have quickly uh, moved to a lower PPO, which to me is suggesting that our momentum to the downside is accelerating. Um, and that is not a good sign. So we have no positive divergence. We are now starting to move back down. The other thing I wanted to mention in my blog article this morning, I had the S&P 500. I did a 60-minute chart. And you can see where the selling at 2940 began to kick in. 
back on October 3rd. We ran all the way down to 27.10, 230 points in about six, seven trading days. That's a lot of movement to the downside. So I was watching Fibonacci on the bounce. And here over the last four or five days, you can see we've gotten into that 38.2 to 50% zone, which a lot of times is it. And if you uh, look, we were holding that rising 20 hour EMA. But if I click on this chart and get an update, you'll see that that did not hold and we have moved lower. And so I think that uh, we uh, had the downtrend, we got our bounce, and I think we're moving back down. I think we need to, at a minimum, probably go back down and test that prior low and maybe even break it and then see what the market is made of. But not looking very good at this point. Okay, I want to move on. We, uh, we're going to do the next segment, which is sound off. And I don't know how many of you have seen sound off before. It's actually one of my favorite uh, segments. Um, but occasionally when we have a special guest on like we do today, Julius, we do a sound off, which allows both of our panelists. I'm going to serve as the moderator during the segment. And I'm going to let Aaron and Greg, or Craig, sorry, Aaron and Julius uh, respond to uh, questions that I have about the overall market. They'll each have 30 seconds to sound off on a variety of topics or stocks. And if they go beyond their 30 second alignment, or allotment, I should say, they'll uh, find that their sound gets turned off. So you've got 30 seconds to respond to these questions. Okay. And I'm going to pull the chart up so you all can just work off of this chart. But my first question, this is a 20-year weekly chart of the U.S. dollar. Got the PMO up here on the top. Mm -hmm. And my question is this. The dollar has been strengthening since 2011. And there are a lot of questions right now with the weakness that we saw in 2017 and this bounce so far this year. Questions are kind of, you know, are we are we rolling over on the dollar or is the dollar regaining its longer term strength? So my question, I guess, first, we'll go to Aaron. Uh, what are you seeing with this dollar chart? You got 30 seconds. Are we are you bullish or are you bearish the dollar? All right. Well, I'm starting to I, I am moving more bullish on the dollar. If you if you did have the thumbnail up, you'd see that the PMO is actually bottomed above the signal line. So I think that that's um, a really good sign. I think when we pulled back, we seem to be holding that support level there at the at the uh, EMA. What is that? The 200 day EMA. So I, I mean, I feel pretty good about uh, I feel pretty good about the dollar right now. I okay, sounds good. I think we got the gist there. Yeah, that all three of the moving averages, by the way, are sitting right here at about this 93 to 94 area. So I certainly get uh, Aaron's point there. All right, Julius, you're up uh, for sound off. You got 30 seconds. Are you bullish or bearish the dollar? I am actually bullish, Tom. And uh, this is a longer term call. What I'm looking at is a massive bottom formation uh, after the decline from the 02 highs all the way down to 08 lows. And if you, you know, take that range from 04 to late 2014, I think that was a massive bottom formation where we broke out. We moved higher and the, the, the decline that we had to. Yep. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I, I'm getting the gist there too. I mean, I hadn't really looked at it like that. But that's a great point, Julius. I mean, we went through a period about 10 years where the dollar went sideways after declining and it did make that big breakout. It made it pretty emphatically as well. So I kind of agree with you. Okay, so yeah, you're and it makes and it makes it it makes it cheap for me to travel to the U.S. So that's an an extra uh, argument. <laughs> there you go. All right, um, next question, and this is going to be right on the heels of that dollar chart. You both think the dollar's going higher. When I look at this dollar chart, and if you go back into 2002 to 2007 when the dollar was declining, this is a chart of materials relative to the S and P 500. So the dollar was falling. Materials were moving higher, outperforming the S&P 500. Since 2011, we have been rising on the dollar, and materials have been underperforming the S&P 500. They are the worst performing sector in the U.S. in 2018. So my question is this. If the dollar is going to continue rising, is there no hope for materials? Are you bullish or bearish materials? Uh, and actually, Julius, you get to go first on this one. 
I need to think like two minutes on this question. <laughs> <laughs> Catching me off guard here. Um, I know, that's the idea. Wow. Um, I actually, it looks to me as if that ratio is going lower. So I would probably be bearish materials versus the S&P 500. So that makes me bearish materials, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I know this is a little bit of a thinking question when you start getting into relative uh, yeah. performance and, and comparing it to another asset, you know, another uh, area like the dollar. Um, so probably this wasn't really fair for a 30 second. No, no, that's cool. Uh, I'm just uh, give me two more seconds. But, you know, if you look at that up move in the ratio, um, you know, from 2000 to that high, which is inverse to the dollar, um, if the dollar went down, if we now think the dollar is going up, that thing must go down. So it makes total sense, actually. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think it does, but I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, you were talking about commodities earlier and how you were looking at possibly, you know, you kept getting head fakes, you know, where the commodities look like they're going to strengthen and then they don't. And I think part of the problem is with this group is that we, in this bull market, we've got a rising dollar. In the last bull market, we had a falling dollar. And I think that makes a big difference. So let, let me get this right. You you think it made sense, but you wanted to have a second opinion from a professional. Yes. I have such, I have such high regard uh, with you, Julius. I have to on this. Sorry, this was too easy. I had to do it. <laughs> All right, Aaron, you've heard a lot here and you've had time to think. 30 seconds. What do you think? You All right. Me. Well, I suspect I, I didn't have a chance to, but I suspect if you did a correlation on this uh, as well, you'd find that they do travel. I mean, look at that. They're almost a perfect mirror of each other. Um, I'm definitely bearish on materials. I did a quick peek at my sector chart, uh, the weekly chart, and it is ugly, ugly. It didn't break out from a bullish formation like it was supposed to. And uh, the PMO is still heading lower on the weekly chart and it's hit negative territory. There's still plenty of room for it to move lower. Okay, cool. All right. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You might have sent a check into the clock operator. That seemed like it was more than 30 seconds, but maybe not. Um, <laughs> Zach, <laughs> all right, Zach's taking care of me. <laughs> all right. You're going to be up next. Um, I'm going to go back over to this relative, or no, not to the relative chart. I'm going to bring up the sound off chart that we like to use. And I talked about this stock earlier today. They had what I thought was probably the best earnings report out today of all of the companies that reported. And uh, actually, let me, I know we don't need the PPO. So let's get rid of that. Yeah, who needs oh, that? Yeah, <laughs> PPO, right. Um, okay, so here you got Philip Morris. So Philip Morris came out earlier today. They had a really good earnings report. They did beat the top line by a wide margin. They crushed their bottom line. The stock had gotten beaten up really badly back in April. And now with this report, you can see it's starting to, at least in my opinion, starting to turn a little bit more bullish uh, in the near term. But my question is this, looking further out with the earnings behind it and uh, with what you see here on the chart, Aaron, would you be uh, bullish or bearish Philip Morris right now? I am bullish. I do happen to hold this. I think I went over it uh, in Anatomy of a Trade yesterday. Okay. So yes, I'm happy today. <laughs> We're having a nice move. Looks like it's going up right now to go close that gap that we had back in April. PMO is turned up above the signal line. Uh, it is. It looks like it might be overbought, but I suspect because it went all the way down in May, uh, well past you know minus five and minus eight on the uh, PMO. I suspect that uh, it can still move higher and accommodate more upside movement. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, Julius, uh, what do you think? What do you think Philip Morris here? I think there is not much upward potential left. I actually think that that gap area, especially the two lows in February and March around 91, that'll be a very difficult hurdle to take, uh, especially with the current market conditions. So I would not buy Philip Morris right here. Um, and as a matter of fact, I know the longer term chart of PM and it has a, if I'm not wrong, a falling resistance coming down where it's probably against or very close to. So I think this is a risky trade. Ah, okay. Would you hold it? <laughs> if I have it, I would hold it, but I, I would not short it, but I would definitely not buy it at this level. Yeah, see, I'm getting my professional advice. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that Erin is trying to get her free uh, uh, investment advice from you, Julius. Send you, guys, send you guys the bill later. 
All right, I like it. Okay, let's uh, move on here. Um, had another one that I thought was kind of an interesting chart. And uh, so let me give you a little backdrop on this one. This is Qualcomm. And if you're not familiar, back in July when they reported their earnings and gapped up with the heavy volume, they also announced that they were going to have a $30 billion share repurchase agreement. And if you're not familiar, Qualcomm only had, had about a $90 billion market cap at that time. So the company, in essence, was saying they were going to buy back one-third of their shares. And of that $30 billion buyback, I believe they said they were going to buy back $10 billion of it over the next 30 days, which would have been during August. You can see the heavy volume and the move to the upside. Since then, the stock went up and has now pulled back quite a bit, uh, down about $12 or $13 from the high before trying to bounce a bit. So here's my question. Based on that information, based on the chart here, uh, what do you think about Qualcomm? Uh, and I guess, Julius, you get to go first here. Would you buy it or would you sell it? I would sell it. Um, it rolled over. It's showing lower highs and lower lows. Uh, it dropped back below that overhead resistance around, what was it, 67 and a half, if I'm correctly. I'm looking at the, the lows all the way to the left in, in 2018. Oh, okay. yep, um, yep. So we're, we're back below that level. Uh, and this is a typical situation that could turn out to be either a um, uh, a little bearish flag or bearish bearish um, pennant. Um, anything below. Yep. Anything <laughs> below something. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would just. Uh, well, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you, Aaron. Here, same question. Qualcomm. Would you buy it or would you sell it? Uh, I would. If if I were holding it, I'd definitely sell it. Um, I, I don't like this. I'm with Julius. I see a reverse flag. Look at the PMO. You know, it's finally hit negative territory. We haven't seen negative territory on the PMO since back in May. And it certainly could move further down to that minus four level. So it could accommodate far more downside. The 20 day EMA is just about ready to close down below the 50 day EMA. That is also a, a bad sign. That'd be an intermediate term. There goes the sound. But I got a follow up question for Aaron. So you got to turn her sound back on. I know, Aaron, you follow. Um, well, I don't know if the, these moving averages aren't the same that you use, though. I was just going to say at this point, we still have a configuration where your short term moving averages are above your yes. other. But I imagine your five day, isn't it the five day that you use? Yes, I use that as well for the shorter term. But, you know, just looking at that, if we get that negative crossover over the 2050, that's an intermediate term trend model neutral signal because they are above the 200 day EMA. So we, we prefer to use a neutral, which is considered like being all cash or fully hedged on whatever vehicle we're looking at. All right, and one follow-up question for Julius. Um, when you get back down into this area where the stock had gapped up with its earnings report, would you be interested at that point or just leave it alone? I, I need to see more of an uptrend. I mean, if I look at the move from May all the way up to 67, that's higher highs, higher lows on this daily chart. That has turned around to lower highs, lower lows. I would at least want to see a couple of higher highs and higher lows before I become interested. All right, got it. Okay, I'm going to do one final one. Um, and so this time, Aaron will go first. Facebook had perhaps the worst earnings report back in uh, July. Big gap down. They're gonna, their earnings are going to be coming up here in another week or two, well, probably two weeks. Um, looking at the chart here, Aaron, what do you think? Buy, sell? Uh, I, you know, I like the way the PMO is configured because I have rising bottoms on it uh, in comparison to those price bottoms. Uh, I think that's positive. We're sitting very close to some uh, support that, you know, that we saw all the way back in March. Uh, but I'm, I, you know, I'd have to see that the PMO is already trying to turn over on today's action. I would really want to see that buy signal come in and hold for a little while, because uh, at this point, I, I'm suspect of what's. Mm -hmm. I got exactly what you're saying. There's definitely a lot of whipsaw back here on the PMO, and I'm sure the MACD, PPO, all of the oscillators trying to figure out what's going on here. All right. Same question, Julius. You're looking at Facebook. They got earnings in a couple of weeks. Looking at the chart, I think I probably know your answer, but what is it, bullish or bearish? Uh, cautiously bearish. If this goes below 150, I'd be extremely bearish because I think that is a major sell signal. The uptrend on the weekly chart that I know on top of my head has been broken already. So 
any rally from here is probably going to be short lived um, to maybe 170, 175. I'd probably be shorting it in 170, 175 area. Okay. Fair enough. I actually, if I had shorted anything, it would have been Facebook and it probably would have been around that 170 level. I thought about it and I just didn't pull the trigger when it went up above this, this uh, previous bottom intraday and then failed and came back down below. I figured that was probably a uh, pretty, a pretty uh, significant sell signal. Turned out that it did go down. I do not have a very good feeling about Facebook as we go forward. They were at an all time high here at 217, 218 when they dropped a bomb on Wall Street, lowering their their profit margins going forward, or their operating margins going forward. And Wall Street obviously did not see that coming. Uh, I don't know. I just, I don't like it much. Yeah. And I know uh, there, it's been in the news. It was in the news today. I think they're talking about uh, Zuckerberg uh, being moved out as chairman. He'd still have a, a super vote, uh, I guess, but uh, he won't be the face of it is what they're talking about. He won't be the face of Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Hey, Julius, uh, thanks for uh, participating. Always fun to have you on here and being a good sport. And uh, My pleasure as always, guys. Mm -hmm. yep, there's a listing of uh, some of the topics, things that we talked about. Uh, a little battle there between Aaron and Julius. I think you all are pretty much on board with just about everything, though. So, uh, yeah, I not think we agreed that. together. Yeah. Maybe I gave you too many easy ones. I think that materials one, I had to throw one in there trying to stay. Yeah, that was sneaky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I am. I'm a little sneaky. It was hard for me to sit back and listen to you both and, you know, analyze the charts without saying something about them, too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, here was the uh, poll today. Thought maybe we'd talk about this for a second before we uh, wrap up. Uh, so, what is everyone's view on the market? And it looks like the majority of respondents here mm. say that the uptrend has ended and we will trade sideways from here. That's interesting. Yeah. A third of the, you know, almost a third, though, think the major top is in. So a third of people, I think, are uh, very bearish. I think this is a pretty good indication of what most people are confused about in the market right now. I mean, we're, we got three answers that are pretty close, and mm -hmm. yet there are three completely different answers. Yeah. How did well, you I How did you answer it? Me? Yeah, I yeah. answered the, the one that's most popular. Okay. Um, Julius? I did not answer it. Will you? <laughs> Come on now. Will, will you? Um, I, uh, let me, I go for the major top in the making. Let's throw some, uh, some uh, stuff in the uh, pond. Yeah, some rocks. All right. I'm gonna, Stir it up a little bit. I'm going to join my co-host and the, uh, the majority. I think we go sideways from here. I don't see enough evidence yet that this is a major top. All right. I don't, I don't yeah. believe it. I think the I think interest rates are moving higher as a signal of a stronger economy ahead. I think everyone's getting scared out of the market right now. I think once it settles down, assuming and this is a big thing, yeah. I think we need to hold the January top or the January February low uh, on the S and P, which is down closer to twenty five hundred. I think if that holds, we go higher eventually. Yeah, I think the question is what what is called a major top. I think that's that's going to be a discussion, of course. Yeah. That yeah. Is, how, yeah. how much. How much do you need for uh, for a major? How much decline do you want to see before you call something a major talk? Yep. Yeah. All right, Julius. It was a pleasure having you on here today. Uh, thank you, my friend, and uh, look forward to having you back soon. Anytime. Awesome. And Aaron, great job as well. And the, you thank can you. see our upcoming schedule here. Got a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Uh, I do want to thank all of you for being with us as well. Please complete the uh, survey as you exit, if you don't mind. We do love to get your feedback. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Thursday afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, we'll see you back in here tomorrow. Happy trading.